Hi, my name is Niklas. I'm an engineering manager at Meta, working on our video calling platform for our family of apps, Facebook, Messenger, Instagram, and Workplace. My talk today is going to cover our adoption of the AV1 video codec for real-time use case. You might remember that last year we had two talks from Google and Vision Neuler that went deep into the performance on benefits of AV1. And if that's something you're interested in, you should definitely go back and listen to those as well. My talk is going to be more focused from a system integrator perspective, focused on doing codec generation shift at large scale. I hope this is something you're going to find beneficial and hopefully be able to apply to other similar technology shifts as well. Anyway, let's start with a quick intro of what everyone is and why we are adopting this codec. Before we go into the real technical details, let's just take a look on why we're doing this. We're doing it to deliver higher quality and a more immersive experience for our users. This is best observed just using your own eye. This is a clip showing a very early integration of everyone into Messenger with a bitrate cap of 300 kilobits per second. We have our old H.264 solution on the left, and you can see everyone on the right. By the way, this is Eric, one of the engineers on the team who actually works on the AV1 integration. This is the type of quality lift we want to deliver to our users as well. Let's go back a bit. AV1, the first specification was standardized by Alliance for Open Media back in 2018. After that, development implementations have progressed, and the codec has recently been deployed at large scale for streaming services with companies like YouTube, Netflix, and also Meta through Instagram and Facebook Reels. For the Meta video streaming use case, there's actually a detailed blog post on the Meta engineering blogs that covers that work in details, and it also gives good examples on the quality gains and bitrate savings they were able to achieve. The RTC use case is always lagging codec adoption compared to streaming, since we need to do both encode and decode on the device in real time. But we believe now is the right time to adopt AV1. And if you haven't started working on that, you should, probably should be doing that. Right now, there's multiple implementations available. You have both commercial and open source version. And we're also seeing hardware offloads starting to ship in devices powered by MediaTek, Qualcomm, and Intel chipsets this year. Especially the open source landscape is very attractive. If you, for example, look at LibAOM, the changelog there, you can see that there's intense work ongoing, focused on the real-time use case with lots of performance improvements, but also improvements for quality and rate control, which is very important for us. Personally, I have been in this industry for a long time. First, I was focused on voice, but now on video. Generation shifts like this is something that happens all the time. We went from H.263, from H.264, we have been moving from proprietary implementations to almost everyone be using WebRTC. However, this is a larger jump than what we used to. In most cases, as you might know, that HEVC or H.265 was never really adopted at large scale for real time, mainly due to the complex licensing situations, which could be a you know, topic for a separate talk. Also, VP9 saw very little deployment outside Google-powered services. That means we, most of us have to make a jump from a 20-year-old code specification to something that's new today. That means there's both big wins to be had, but there's also large challenges to overcome. Let's start to look at the opportunities we have here. I already showed a quality example, but let's try to measure that as well. Measuring video quality is a complex topic, but a relatively simple way to look at it is to use the BD rate metric. BD rate compares how much bitrate different codec needs to produce a certain quality level. By generating multiple samples at different bitrate and measuring the quality, we can generate a rate distortion curve. And if you lock down the quality level in the rate distortion curve, you can derive the BD rate. In our testing, using normal videos from cameras similar to video calling, we see bitrate savings in the range of 30 to 40% using AV1. Most of the time, we are not going to use those bitrate savings to actually save bandwidth. We're going to use that to deliver higher quality to our users. There has been a lot of improvements in connectivity and mobile networks, but for us, we still see that 
20% of our video calls end up using less than 200 kilobit bitrate. And especially for those users, these changes will have a large impact on the quality of experience. Screen content is also becoming more and more important for meta use cases. We have use cases like game streaming, VR remote desktop, that both require high quality encoding with low latency. And this is an area where everyone truly shines. Traditionally, you might know that video codecs are normally not that good at doing screen content, especially with text and a lot of high frequency contents. But thanks to the more advanced coding tools in everyone, we can see up to 80% video rate savings, which is just truly massive. You can also see from this graph that as you move to even higher resolutions, the difference becomes even larger. At least for us, 4K real-time streaming with low latency is a very relevant use case, both in gaming and other metaverse use cases. Similar to the video clip I showed earlier, we can also just look at the quality difference experience ourselves. Here we have the same content process with H.264 and everyone. You can especially look at the quality of the text as it scrolls, but also the quality of Eric's face during the progression of the clip. If you look at things more from a system level, there's even more gains to be had. Resolution changes is very common in the real-time use case, since you normally traverse a large range of available bit rates. Thanks to a feature called reference picture resamplings, which I'm going to call RPR, Going forward, we don't have to generate a new keyframe anytime the resolution changes, which is a big win. It's quite intuitive to get that, you know, when you are reducing the, your resolution because your network capacity goes down, that is the last, the worst possible moment to generate a large expensive keyframe. We see in our stats that there's a direct connection between how many keyframes we send and the video pieces we see in our stats. And currently, we generate on average one and a half keyframe per minute just to support resolution changes during calling. RPR is also closely linked to spatial scalability, which means that we are getting true scalability feature, which is something we want to leverage. Currently, like many others, we're using simulcasts for large calls, and there's definitely limitations to that when it comes to really deliver the best quality possible for each individual users. Simulcast is also a major source of excessive keyframe generation. We see if we filter in our really large calls, we're actually doing up to four keyframes change generations a minute just to pour support simulcast layer switching. I mentioned that everyone was already adopted for streaming, and that's something that always happens a couple of years earlier compared to RTC. First of all, you don't have to do real-time encoding on, on the device. But you can also afford to do really expensive encoding on the back end because you can actually reuse that content over and over. You also have the ability to do two pass encoding that makes rate control and quality control much more exact. For a streaming service, there's also a direct connection between bitrate and your distribution cost, which makes it much more obvious and easy to decide that you should invest in a more advanced codec. For us to decide that we should invest in everyone for RPC, we started with an offline evaluation project. We compared both different implementations in terms of quality and performance, but also compared this to our existing solution. We mapped it to our user data to estimate which percentage we will be able to reach and also how large quality gains they would get. After that, we moved on to a first set of integrations to be able to showcase this in real time. We made the problem a bit simpler by, for example, running everyone on our desktop clients, using it for employees to be able to set aside some of the known problems I'm going to talk about later. But anyway, we were able to make sure that we could discover if there was any unknown problems we had to tackle, and we could also validate our evaluation results. The last step that we're working on now is really to scale this to our entire user base. We are a consumer-focused platform, as you know, and we have a very diverse user base across the entire planet. That means we have to be a bit more conservative, for example, compared to, for example, an enterprise solution where you know you're going to be on good network with higher performing hardware. I'm going to dig a bit deeper into some of the challenges we have to overcome. I'll start with binary size. If you use LibAOM, integrate that into WebRTC, you're going to add roughly one megabyte to your application or 500K to your distribution size. 
if you're a startup trying to get your first users, this is probably nothing you care about. But if you are a company that serves billions of people, this is a major hurdle to overcome. We know that binary size affects upgrade success rate. And with lower upgrade success rate, that means we're going to have many more users stuck on old clients. Binary size also affects application startup time. And time to incoming ringing for a call is a super critical stat for us. Binary size also affects general software health metrics like memory usage and crash rate. Increasing your binary size by 500k is a major thing. For us, that could be equivalent to a large team's feature budget for an entire year. There's no way we can just go ahead and add that and measure then measure what the gain is. We need to have really solid data from our users first. Because of that, we are initially relying on a dynamic download framework that downloads everyone as a separate component and feature for clients that have the bandwidth to do so. Long term, we need to invest in reducing the library size calling, uh, hopefully in collaboration with LibAON. And that's something that would unlock us, including everyone in all clients by default. We're also looking at options to you know, save some of the binary size impact by reusing decoders we already have. For example, an app might already have an AV1 decoder for video streaming. And in some cases, also the operating system includes a decoder. Binary size might not be an issue for you and for all applications. However, CPU usage will be an issue. You probably know that media compression is always a trade-off between quality, bitrate, and processing requirements. This is yet another clear example of that. So when, even if you use AV1 in a low complexity mode, you have the real-time settings, it's still something like the factor of three more expensive encoding compared to our H.264 solution we use today. For us, talk time is the number one top level metric we care about. We are not shipping any feature that decreases talk time. We also unfortunately know that there is a direct link between battery usage and talk time. If you increase battery usage by 1%, your average talk time will drop by almost the same amount. Luckily, we also know that increasing quality will drive up a talk time, but we need to make sure we strike the right balance here. First of all, we had to start with establish what is the actual power cost of shifting to everyone. Luckily, increasing the encoding load by three times doesn't mean your power consumption go up three times. That would be impossible. For example, we know that the biggest power user on a phone normally is a display. And even if your SOC comes in at number two, that one is also used for many other applications and features in your app and encoding. To establish the real cost, we have measured the actual power utilization on a normal call using both AV1 and H264. Essentially, we have hooked up phones, uh, bypassed the battery, and connected them directly to a power meter during calls. In this test device, this is a Pixel 7, we see, for example, an increase of power by 110 milliwatts when switching to AV1 compared to H264 during a typical calling scenario. This is an increase in the order of 4%, depending on other factors like screen brightness and, and background activities. So this is the number we had to work with and overcome. Even though 4% is much smaller than 300%, it's not small enough to just ship everyone blindly for all clients. We need to make sure that we maximize the benefits by, while we also minimize any negative impact. One way to do this is to leverage dynamic coding switching depending on the current situations. There's no direct like API support in WebRTC to do this, but both WebRTC and S2P allows you to use any codec that the receiver support, even though the normal use case is that you just stick to the highest priority codec. We also know that the low bitrate call will benefit the most from everyone. And the good thing is that low bitrate calls are normally using lower resolution, and lower frame rate, which make encoding cost a smaller fraction of the total power use. So by dynamically switching codec depending on bitrate and resolution, that allows us to find a sweet spot where we can get the quality gains without introducing regressions. We can also try to be smart by taking other factors into the equations. 
For example, you can look at device information. Is this a high performance CPU? Does this device have a large battery? Or you can also be even smarter and look at the actual battery situation during the call. Will switching driver one make it likely that we're running into a low battery situation on this phone or not? We also have a smaller set of challenges to resolve. These are more typical to any code exchange you're doing. First of all, rate control is super important for real times. We know there is a direct link between how well the rate control works and video freezes on the other side. Initially, everyone was not on par with our H.264 solutions. This is not so strange because this is something we have worked a lot on improving for H.264. But now, we have been able to work to tweak and tune our everyone implementation so we are actually on par with H.264 and we just now started the discussion with Google on how we can upstream this to LibAOM and make it available to all users. Similar, tuning resolution and frame rate scaling depending on the content and bitrate is a codex specific function. We have seen a lot of gains from tuning this in the past and especially with the feature of RPR, we have to dig deeper into that and see how we really can optimize the scaling function for everyone. Lastly, for in offline testing, it's very easy to compare different codecs. You can use quality tools like PSNR and VMAP, but they don't work to track the user experience in the field. The current set of tools we use for our field metrics are codec dependent, and we are working on creating metrics that we can use across different codecs to fully measure the quality impact. For us, this is going to be a long journey. We are already using everyone on a daily basis, but we're going to spend at least the entire year on increasing mobile deployment. In the meantime, we're also working on leveraging everyone for other metaverse use cases. Normal cases, we have a lot more control over hardware and use case, so we can be a bit more aggressive in deployments. There's going to be a coexistence of multiple codecs for a long time, probably forever. H.264 is not going to go away soon, and we've already seen that there's new technology around the corner. We have both BVC and AV2 on its way. So I think we all have to prepare our architecture to handle this type of multi-codec coexistence for a long time. Hope this was useful. Thank you very much for your time. Looking forward to any questions you might have.